Well, thanks everybody for, for being here. Uh, really quick, my name is Ben Briard. I'm a product manager here at Red Hat. So uh, my focus is on kind of lower level pieces of the operating system. Uh, I've been mainly focused on everything we're doing on the CoreOS, like RHEL CoreOS side of the house and you know, kind of how we're tying into OpenShift uh, that was kind of talked about earlier this morning. Uh, also spent a lot of time working on uh, systemd and some of our container technologies and so forth. Uh, and we're going to talk about a super important topic today. Uh, if you guys are familiar uh, with control groups, raise your hand. Has anybody ever heard of these? So like half the room. No, no, no. Leave your, leave your hands up. Uh, now, if you've ever logged into a Linux box within the last five years, it's a little... <laughs> I, I'm not. I'm a little surprised at that, but uh, okay. Uh, now, what about if you've logged into Facebook? Come on, guys. <laughs> or use some of Google services. Every hand in this room should be up, right? That's pretty much everybody. Okay. So you have all interacted with uh, Linux control groups, whether you've known it or not, right? This is one of the primary, uh, you know, kernel APIs that we use for containerization, and you know. Uh, isolation, uh, accounting, and all, all this kind of stuff. Uh, so anyway, with us today, uh, we're really excited that these guys came, so thank you guys for being here. It's a big deal that they're here. So uh, I'll start with Taejun. Uh, he's the upstream maintainer for control groups uh, from Facebook. So you know, he's pretty Hi. much the authority on this topic. So thank you very much for coming out here. Uh, and then Felipe uh, from Google, who is literally on the front lines uh, doing all of the V2 integration stuff in container space, uh, or I should say leading that effort. Uh, so, and we're, we're gonna dive into some of those specifics as we go. Uh, but first, I'm gonna kick it to Taejun to kinda walk through. Sure. Um, the control groups at Facebook. So we're gonna start with um, what we are doing with uh, resource control or C group two uh, at Facebook. And then we are going to go into how, you know, we are, how Philippe is planning to <laughs> integrate everything uh, into libcontainer and 1C so that they can transition to C group 2. Um, they are uh, still on C group 1. Um, and, and, you know, then we will go into how, how we can make the transition for the greater ecosystem. Um, so I'm just going to start with my portion. Um, so I want to start with this graph. Um, if you think about a web server, um, you know, it's, a, it's a from our production web server. So we have a lot of web servers, but everybody has a lot of web servers, right? If you think about a web server in a large fleet, um, it's not going to just have that web server, right? It's going to have a lot of monitoring, you know, chef, a lot of, you know, machine maintenance and, and all those stuff. And um, sometimes, like, those things go wrong, right? Uh, you run chef, you know, it runs yum and whatever, and somebody, you know, makes one innocuous one-line change, and sometimes that just leaks a lot of memory, right? Imagine that happening. Um, so this is kind of simulating that. So the, the purple line, uh, just concentrate on the purple line, that's the RPS request per second, right? right? So that line is uh, what, we are doing, uh, what happens when you are doing load testing. So the, that web server is now fully loaded. So um, if you look at the first red line, that's you know, where we start 10 megabps memory leak uh, in, in the part of system, which is just, you know, support, support part of the system. So it's not the main workload, but it's the management part, and it starts leaking memory. After about, I don't know, four or five minutes, um, you know, it consumes whatever is left in terms of memory in the system, and the system starts thrashing, right? And then it, it dips because, you know, there's no memory, and this is a hard disk machine. So hard disk is really slow. If you run out of memory, you're accessing hard drive, and it's slow, so it dips. And the kernel reclaims some memory. It manages to come up again. Then it comes down again, and it just dies. That, that flat line is just loss of data points, right? The machine completely checks out. Um, after a while, so we disabled uh, uh, our remediation uh, mechanism, like uh, outside monitoring. So it stays, stayed down longer. It would have come a little bit sooner, but you know, it's still the same thing. Um, after about, I don't know, half an hour, the machine got rebooted, and then it comes back up again. Now imagine like this happening um, synchronized across a lot of machines. And that does happen in the fleet, right? It's kind of surprising sometimes when that happens, it's kind of really scary. Uh, but you know, some code changes, some bugs trigger at the same time. It's really scary. So if this happens in a lot of machines at Facebook, Facebook is going down, right? Nobody's gonna be happy, everybody's getting paged. Um, so it's not a happy situation. Um, now look at the green line. Uh, that's the same thing. Uh, it's uh, doing exactly the same testing. 
uh, but with resource control set up to protect the main workload from the rest of the system. So the first, first uh, 10 megabyte line, we started the same thing. It dropped a bit, drops a bit and recovers, right? And it's completely fine. So we started it again, another leak. Um, that's the same thing. We did it three times. And it only dips maybe 20% for a minute or two, right? We can survive that, right? People may get paged, but this is survivable. We are a lot happier with this graph. Um, so, you know, from purple to green, it's a, a lot of improvement, right? We all want to have that. Um, so we are a resource control group at Facebook, and this is our mission statement. Um, we're conserving full OS resource isolation. To unpack that a bit, we're conserving is that, um, that we don't want to pay, right? We want to we wanna have resource isolation, but we don't want to pay overhead nominally, right? Like if we go into like, you know, our production tiers and ask them, yeah, we can protect your workload, but you got to pay 10% of your machines, right? Nobody's going to buy that. So we want to keep uh, performance the same. It's it got to be mostly free. Um, full OS means that it got to be transparent, right? We don't want to go into the um, um, production you know, teams and ask them uh, to put like, severe restrictions on their applications. We want them to be able to keep doing whatever they've been doing, and we want to layer uh, uh, resource isolation transparently on top. So that's our goal. Um, and um, um, if you think about that, right, I mean, it kind of sounds simple, right? If you have control groups, which, you, which says that you know, it can categorize workloads and distribute resources, it should be easy. Um, so the, the term epitax is what we use for those management part of the system, right? So every host in our fleet has to pay a tax to be inside Facebook, uh, inside Facebook fleet. So that's Epitax. And so the project became Epitax, right? We, are wanna, we wanna protect the main workloads from malfunctions in the tax part. And um, we chose this project because uh, it's minimum, right? I mean, if you have working resource isolation, this should be possible. And, and this is the minimum you, can, you should be able to achieve. So this is the minimum viable product in terms of memory and IO isolation. Uh, we didn't get to I mean, we mostly invested in investigated uh, memory and I/O isolation because you know CPU isolation is uh, easier and, and more difficult in a, in a different terms. So we concentrate on memory and I/O uh, for this project. And these were the requirements. Um, so when something misbehaves in system slice or in the rest of the system, which is not the main workload, the main workload, the impacts on main workload should be limited, right? The main workload should be able to survive. It might not be 100% you know, perfect, but you know, the impact should be like you know, 10, 20% for a short while so that the, you know, the fleet can stay, stay up. And um, as I said before, uh, we didn't want uh, our applications to be changed at all. We wanted uh, resource control to be layered on top transparently. And of course, uh, work conservation, right? We don't want any performance regression, right? We cannot sell this if we, they have to pay five, 10%. It just doesn't fly. So um, it kind of sounds simple, right? Um, if you have working resource control, how, how hard can that be, right? You just said memory limits, you know, IO limits, and you should be done. Um, but if you look at the project name, it's Epitex2, right? It has two because the first attempt failed miserably. Um, <laughs> like, you know, everything else at Facebook. Um, <laughs> so, um, cut, cut that off the recording. <laughs> So, um, so one one of the problem was that I don't see any clock here. Let me on. Oh. Uh, okay, yeah. sure. Um, so one of the um, problem. Um, so there there were a lot of challenges in, in different areas, but like the the biggest one, or like the one in terms of memory management, memory control, was that um, there's a like if you look at single one, right? There are two knobs, right? Uh, in terms of memory control, one is memory limiting bytes, and the other one is soft limiting bytes, right? They have like a subtle differences, but like um, what they eventually do, uh, ultimately do, is putting a hard cap on how much memory that secret can consume. And um, this didn't really work well, so we, we tried to use it. I mean, it's an obvious thing to do, right? Uh, I want to protect main workload from the system that slice, so we're going to put memory limit on system that slice, and that should be fine. Um, 
didn't really work out because um, it turned out that under maximum load, machines are often oversubscribed, right? I mean, not constantly. I mean, if the, a machine is constantly oversubscribed, it cannot sustain the workload, right? right? But it would nominally sub, uh, oversubscribe temporarily here and there, right, when something happens, right? And, and it might drop a bit, but you know, the machine would be able to sustain that. The problem with like, putting hard limits on memory consumption is that if you put it too low, right, if you restrict the management part too hard, then the system will really suffer because the management part is constantly thrashing, right? But if you put it too high so that you know, the management part can, can breathe, um, then the protection might not be enough. Um, and the problem is that the barrier should change it dynamically, right? And if you set it at any level, um, you, are, you are setting a barrier in terms of memory distribution, so you are kind of lowering the overall memory efficiency. And if the system is oversubscribed already, right, they're just gonna put it further um, into the, you know, the band. So we realized that when we tried this, right, uh, more machines were f falling over than before. So um, it didn't work out. And of course, it was really difficult to configure. You gotta have to like, find the exact you know, number of bytes um, which can ride between those two lines. And another part was that um, if you think about like, um, memory and I.O., they are really not separate at all, right? Um, so if you set memory limits on something and, and that's smaller than, if that's smaller than, lower than, it's working, natural working set, it's gonna generate a lot of IOs because it you know, doesn't have a lot of memory, so you know, kind of memory management kicks in and, and kicks out you know, what it thinks to be cold pages, which are actually active uh, uh, working set. And you know, soon after, it will try to fold them back in, right? So that just generates a lot of IOs, whether you have swap or not. Swap doesn't really matter, right? All your code pages get swapped, uh, get you know, folded out and, and folded back in. So that just generates a lot of IOs. And um, if you're having like IO storm happening in, in the management part, that's gonna affect your main workload, right? If the main workload does anything, any IO is gonna get affected. And um, so, yeah, that was another problem that we noticed. Um, and if you remember the first script that I showed you, right, there's like this 20 minute stretch where there's no data point being reported, right? The machine is still alive, right? I mean, like it's powered up, you know, it's running like full tilt. Like if you look at the energy consumption from the um, management interface, it's just consuming all the power there is. Um, the problem is that the kernel's way of recognizing that the system doesn't have enough memory is kind of crude, right? Uh, and it's, it kind of, in a sense, it just has to be a really conservative because you don't want kernel to be you know, killing things willy-nilly, right? So, um, so kernel's criteria for triggering um killing um, is really conservative, and um, that often means that um, you would fall into a condition where the system is really not doing anything. It's just kind of uh, thrashing. The only thing it's doing is thrashing, but the kernel would still think that, yeah, it seems to be making forward progress. So your service is down, but the kernel thinks that it's okay. That's why you get you know, that 20 minute stretch of the machine being unresponsive. And then you know, something external has to resolve that by rebooting it. So obviously, you know, that's not good, right? And it also combines with the first point, right? If you set memory limit, right? The really interesting thing is you can uh, uh, fall into this thrashing condition even with you know, free memory available, right? A, a C group has memory limit, the workload you know, hits against it, and it, goes, it tries to go over, but it can't. So it keeps thrashing, and then they can actually you know, bring down the whole system to make the whole system unresponsive. So by setting memory limit, you actually made your system worse. That actually happens a lot. Um, and uh, also IO control. Um, and also we didn't realize that, we realized that we didn't have any working IO controller. Um, because, like, one example is that like the memory controllers, uh, the I/O controllers we have, don't really translate uh, across you know really high ops devices and, and you know hard disks at the same time. But the bigger problem was that um, none of the existing ones handled um, shared I/Os that well. Like if you think about like a file system operations um, or swap, 
right? When, when, uh, uh, when you make, a, make changes to files, it generates a lot of metadata IOs, right? And the thing with metadata, metadata IOs is that um, they, they are serialized. Um, if you, ext4 journal, right? ext4 journal is fully serial. So it doesn't matter who you are. If you create a journal entry, you created a strict ordering there, right? So you cannot really store that. Um, it just has to be executed right away. But, right, if you think about it, that should still be charged to the guy who calls that I.O. So the, none of the existing I.O. controllers did that, which means that if somebody causes a lot of metadata I.O.s or a lot of swap I.O.s, they would get away um, with it without being charged. And you know, that obviously you know, ruins isolation. So uh, we worked um, a couple of years on it. It took a, l a lot longer than we expected. Um, and, and so these are the solutions that, that uh, we came up with. So in C group two, um, there's a memory.low and memory.min, right? So, so there's a, a low, uh, min, low, high, max, right? So high and max, high is best effort uh, limit, max is absolute limit, you know, if you try to go over it, you, you're gonna get killed. Low is the kind of, you know, the other way around. Low is best effort guarantee. Um, the kernel might break it if it's in emergency. Um, min is stricter than that, right? Um, it would, the kernel would kill something else before breaking, breaking it. Um, so memory that low and mean uh, lifts up, you know, don't push down. Um, and another part of that, another kind of really nice property that we added to low and min is that uh, the protection is proportional. Uh, in the sense that, let's say your working set size is 10 gigabyte, right? And, and it, it kind of varies over time. Let's say it swings between nine and, nine and 11 gigabytes. And like, without pro what it does is that you can set then uh, the protection as say eight gigabyte or six gigabyte even, and then it will, it will keep that proportional like gradual, gradually folding protection beyond that point. So you don't have to get the number exactly right um, you can just kind of ballpark it conservatively, and it will still give you, you know, sufficient protection. Um, so that made, you know, configuration a lot easier, and we basically can use almost the same configuration, you know, everywhere. Not everywhere, but, you know, almost everywhere. So it's kind of, uh, in terms of operational simplicity, it, it helps a lot. Um, and and uh, Joseph Basik uh, of our team implemented IO latency. Um, this is completion latency-based IO control, and the, one thing uh, special about this uh, controller that, that we uh, hope to add to other controllers too is that it handles back charging, meaning that if a C group does a shared IO, like a metadata or swap IO, it will go through because otherwise there will be priority inversion, but it will get charged later, like a credit card, you know, you spend first, but you get charged later and you pay for it. Um, so it maintains overall isolation. Um, and the thing is that I, I said that um, I said that memory and I/O are conjoined, right? So if you try to control memory, you have to control I/O together. Otherwise, you are just you know pushing on one side and getting getting leaks on the other side. And this is why like one of the fundamental differences between C group one and C group two. So C group one um, has like uh, per controller per per resource type, everything is completely independent, right? There's no like you can create multiple trees and there's no easy way to correlate them with each other. And that kind of creates a problem when you have to control resources in conjunction with other resources. Um, so in C group two, um, like uh, there's a, a concept of resource domain. So when you create you know, memory pressure, you can tie it to the same resource domain that IO controller can look at. So you can control both memory and IO on the same resource domain. Um, yeah, that's uh, one of the critical uh, enabling uh, things about C group two to make this possible. And, um, and also we added something called PSI. Um, what, what PSI tell you is that like how short of a specific resource uh, the workload um, is under, right? So for example, if it says I am under 20% memory pressure, it means that the workload is 20% slower 
because it didn't have enough memory for the past minute average, or like it has different average um, intervals. Um, and that helps a lot in terms of uh, allocating resources and monitoring um, uh, workload health. If you remember what I talked about kernel umkiller, right? The problem with kernel umkiller was that it couldn't tell whether the workload was healthy or not, right? Um, so it would kick in too late um, to be useful. But using PSI, um, we get a kind of canonical way of telling whether a workload is healthy or not, right? If something is slowed by, I don't know, if your web server is slowed down by 40%, it's obviously not healthy, right? You're not doing a good job. And, and kernel, for kernel umkiller, right, it would never kick in at that ratio, right? Kernel umkiller would only kick in when the pressure goes up to 99 something percent. Um, so based on PSI, excuse me, uh, we, we implemented something called umdi, it's already two, like, like everything else. Um, <laughs> So it watches like this system metrics. Uh, PSI is the main source, but it also watches other metrics, and it is really configurable. So you can tell, you know, uh, things like, you know, if workload is suffering more than five percent, and system, uh, you know, the, the management part is doing more than this, you know, we know that you know system part is messing up the workload, then it will go out and kill whatever is misbehaving in system. Um, and on top of that. Um, we also deploy BottleFS um, on all resource control machines. And the reason for that is um, a little bit, um, con not, not convoluted, but um, a little bit subtle, uh, is that we, we used to use exe4 um, for our root file systems a lot, mostly. And the problem there was that uh, exe4 journal creates this kind of really bad priority emergence, emergence um, that where a high priority C group would end up waiting for a low priority C group. Um, I'm sure it can be fixed, but uh, like our, um, our team um, had a lot more um, BottleFS expertise than EXT4. So we fixed everything in BottleFS and then we are just switching over to BottleFS. But you know, this, this should be fixable in other file systems too. So um, all that said, um, this is a similar test. So we are in the process of um, um, Certifying this, or like you know, qualifying this on different service tiers and deploying them, deploying them, and this is a more modern machine. This is an SSD machine, and again, you know, uh, green and, and purple line, um, you know, green line, you know, three three uh, uh, memory leaks. It doesn't even you know, it doesn't matter. This is fine. Purple line, you know, that's not good. Um, but you know, the the difference is uh, uh, more striking now because you know we have more I/O, um, better I/O, and this is a, a mem cache. Um, here, it's a kind of similar testing, and the graph color is not great, but like the top, you know, the green line at the top, um, which is barely visible, um, is the protected machine, and the, you know, orange line, which is, you know, going away, is, you know, obviously the unprotected one. And with, um, this was with, I think, uh, 50 megabyte per second leak, um, you know, and, you know, the, with the protection, the machine didn't care. You, can, you cannot even tell uh, in its performance. Any difference? So um, we have this uh, minimally uh, verified, um, minimally viable product in terms of uh, work conserving memory and I/O isolation. You know, in in this Amputex2, which is the workload protection, work workload and host protection scheme. And um, I, I said that it is a minimum, minimally viable product, right? What that means is that uh, of the of the pieces that I talked about, like of these things, if you take out one, it's not gonna work, right? I mean, it may work to a certain extent, but it's, you know, it's not gonna be reliable because all these pieces are needed to actually contain both memory and I.O., and if you don't contain both, then it's not gonna work. Um, so we have that basis now, and we are in the process of uh, developing um, more um, profiles. So let's say this is workload protection profile. Um, and now we are in the process of developing a side workload profile where, where if you have like this isolation, right, if you can protect main workload from the um, side, uh, from the rest of the system, then you can do, you know, whatever you want on the, on the side part of the system, right, without affecting main workload too much. And, and so we are uh, in the process of uh, uh, experimenting with and developing that. And um, the requirement there is that uh, 
the latency impact on main workload uh, should be limited or controlled. And also, there should be no difference, no regression whatsoever in terms of digestal readiness, meaning that when the main workload wants to spike up, it should be allowed to, as if there's no side workload. And the second, uh, the other thing that we are working on is, um, well, uh, this might be more interesting to, to you guys, I guess, uh, is that you know, when you put multiple uh, containers or, or workloads on the same system, and you wanna say, this guy gets you know, 20%, this guy gets 40%, um, this doesn't work reliably yet, uh, mostly because of IO isolation, so we are uh, working on that one. So one um, takeaway that uh, I wanna say is that, um, as I said, um, having one component configured doesn't really help you much. It might even hurt you. Um, so it might be interesting thing to think about, like if anybody wants a resource isolation in their system, um, you know, um, it's not a single knob, it's a, 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 a profile of configurations to protect all affected sites. And I'm gonna yeah. hand over to Thank Philippe. You. Thank you. Yeah, so I'm, I'm uh, Felipe. I'm, uh, I, I'm, I work at Google, I work on Kubernetes, I work on the Node components, so Kubelet. And I have been working trying to bring all this goodness into the Kubernetes world. And, uh, and mainly the first component here is bringing uh, version two of C groups into Kubernetes. And um, so uh, I'm gonna talk about that, uh, that project a little bit. Uh, of course, we want all the components, we wanna look at PSI, we wanna um, get uh, UMD working, UMD2, uh, but C group V2 is, is, is basically like the, the first uh, step towards that. Um, so uh, earlier on, um, Renal and Urvashi was, were, were talking about like the, the components in the stack and run C is basically the component that ends up running the container. So like uh, either, either you're using like OpenStack or, or uh, sorry, OpenShift or um, Kubernetes, are using Cryo or ContainerD or Docker, you're, you're mainly running, uh, you end up using run C. And um, Run C um, created this library called libcontainer to um, abstract all these steps of creating um, um, a Linux container. That's, that's what we see today as, that's, that's what we basically run today. Um, uh, libcontainer is uh, not cgroup2 friendly and that's what we're trying to fix. Um, so systemd is the path towards cgroup v2 because everybody loves systemd and uh, Essentially, systemd has been uh, embracing cgroup2 API. Um, a lot of cgroup v2 uh, design was was uh, was uh, was made based on feedback from from systemd. Systemd has become, uh, in a way, like an API to um, to to kernel features from from user space. And uh, yeah, so um, libcontainer already has uh, two separate drivers. One of them tries to write directly to, to the cgroup uh, file system. And the second one uh, tries to, to go through, this, through systemd. Uh, actually, um, OpenShift will use the systemd driver already. Uh, so in a way, it's kind of like uh, problem solved, but uh, not really because uh, it's, uh, it's uh, kind of like going around systemd in many ways and writing directly to the tree and making lots of, lots of assumptions about uh, a version one of C groups. Um, so uh, systemd also uh, offers um, like a transition path, essentially, because um, uh, you can configure it to use uh, to mount a C group v v1 only uh, to hybrid mode, which is what you end up seeing in most distributions these days, where it's, where it's, it's, it's mounting both uh, version one and version two. Uh, it's basically using version one to control all of the, the the limits, but version two is already mounted there. And um, unified mode, which is uh, uh, only C group two is mounted, and that's where we want to go. Um, so libcontainer has the cgroup driver, and uh, it, it makes all the cgroup1 assumptions right indirectly to the cgroup3, and uh, doesn't work at all with the unified uh, hierarchy. And uh, so um, um, I'm starting a plan to, a three-step plan to, to fix this system DC group driver. Uh, first of them is actually uh, setting, setting systemd properties um, instead of writing to the C group tree. So like uh, when you start a systemd unit, be, be it like a service unit or a scope unit, which is mostly what container managers use, 
a scope unit, you can tell it uh, which kind of memory limits, CPU limits, uh, and so on to use. So you're basically abstracting it, telling system D, these are the limits I want, and system D can figure out whether it's using C group one or C group two, or in the future C group three, it's gonna basically keep, keep this kind of API. Um, uh, while uh, system D is useful to, to write, the, the, to set these properties and modify these properties, reading the stat statistics is something you wanna go directly to the, to the C group three to, to read. So uh, you're gonna have to detect whether you're running on the, the unified hierarchy or not, but there, is, there are some simple and documented ways to do this by checking this, the sysfs cgroup uh, file system, checking if it's a cgroup2 file system directly, then you know you're using a unified hierarchy, and you can de detect a hybrid case as well. And step three is uh, fix uh, delegation. So delegation is a, a concept in systemd where like you create a scope unit and uh, you give it to the container manager, in this case, uh, like um, run C, lib container, uh, kubelet. And uh, once they get this unit, they're free to use the subtree as well as they want. But there's a caveat that like, you should actually uh, create a, a subdirectory because that top level, uh, uh, that, the top level um, item in the hierarchy, like the, the top level C group is, is one that uh, systemd wants to keep controlling. Uh, in case you wanna, so, so you can actually enforce like memory uh, limits and not let your containers that are running there uh, kind of bypass the, the limits set by the, the system. Um, uh, one problem with, 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 uh, with doing this is that um, uh, OCI specs, which basically come from the, the, the Docker image and Docker uh, specs that were created like uh, a few years ago, uh, were created with uh, C group one in mind because that's what was pervasive at the time. Um, and uh, so like uh, a lot of the items that the, the spec lets you set uh, don't really, are not really matches to the C group two. Uh, so uh, in some cases we can do translations. In some cases we can uh, ignore some settings. Say you, you set something that's not available on, on C group two, we can ignore it. But uh, the, the, the main thing is like, um, one of the big motivations for moving to C group two is we want to start making sh making good use of these limits, like the the the, min, the memory mi memory limits. Like traditionally, we only had the the hard limit at the top and the soft limit for a for a soft reservation. That's not as good as the the new soft the, the new reservation limit, which is memory low. And the the hard limit, for instance, in um, in C group v one is something we, we don't even uh, like really use right now in, 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 in Kubernetes because we, we don't want ums in our containers. So like we're basically monitoring and uh, evicting uh, pods. And uh, we would, would really like to be able to, to set some pressure on some containers when they're going above their, their, um, their uh, assigned uh, limits. And the memory high is actually like a great limit to do that. So like we wanna start using those new, uh, new limits and we probably need to address that into the OCI specification as well. Fantastic, <clears throat> excuse me. So it's interesting. So for you know, well over a decade, we've had Secret V1 in place, right? So it's one of the most okay, kind of well-established uh, you know, like underlying APIs, right? That we have to work with. So it's, it is pervasive and any type of you know, resource allocation you know, today uses it. So you know, we contrast that though to what we hear from you know, talking to customers and those running large, uh, you know, could be OpenShift or Kubernetes environments. You know, there's a big push right now uh, of running, running this stuff on bare metal, right? Because you know, why should I pay the tax of that if you know, I, I already own these systems, for example? And right now, one of the, one of the challenges there is uh, just, you know, we were actually talking about this over lunch, uh, you know, there is overhead in the system, right? And Secrets V2 is not a magic bullet that's gonna just solve all of that challenge, but uh, this is actually probably one of the best knobs and levers we can pull by moving the ecosystem over to V2 uh, to get that utilization up to warrant running on, on some of these larger servers, right? Uh, today you end up tapping out a lot of subsystems before you get to capacity on a lot of systems, or at least that's a large amount of the feedback we've gotten. Um, so there's other obstacles to solve before we can just flip the switch to where most Linux distros are, are running V2. Um, 
you know, when you look at it from the operating system point of view, uh, you know, we, we gain a lot from sensible defaults in Linux, right? If you've ever done any performance tuning, you know, well, there's a reason why it's set that way out of the box. So, you know, when you install RHEL or Fedora or any flavor of Linux, you, you expect uh, these three things listed on top to basically just work out of the box, right? Um, so when we look at kind of where V2 adoption's at here on the vert side, we're actually sitting pretty good. So they've already done, uh, at least with Libert and KVM stack, uh, version, was it five, uh, has support for the memory and, C and secret controller, which are two of the most common ones that you use on the vert side. Um, the rest are, are targeted for 5.1 or 5.2, so vert is clean to move over to V2. Um, and then from the container side, right, that's actually probably the biggest, or not the biggest, that's the next barrier, right, uh, that we have because it would not be good if you install the box and your Docker run or Podman run just fails, right? Like that's, it's not a good experience, uh, which is why why this work is so is so important here. Uh, when we look at other uh, container engines, uh, SysMD Inspawn and LXE already support V2, uh, so it will be fantastic once uh, you know OCI and, and kind of the Run C stuff works as well. Now on the Kubernetes side, this is actually probably the longest road we have ahead of us um, because again. Uh, you know, we, we talked earlier that the OCI specs are very V1 centric. Well, so is the Kube API in several ways. So uh, this is actually probably the longest road. Uh, but you know, we we can't actually start that until we get higher level stuff uh, done. So sorry, Mernal, you got you got some homework. <laughs> um, so yeah, so the the work is going on the specs. There's meetings like like this week happening on this stuff, right? So this is this is all actively in progress right now. Um, but this is actually an interesting lesson uh, that we can all learn from. When you write a technical spec, there's a, there's a cost to that when you write it to a very specific implementation, right? Uh, and so this is kind of why we're having to go in and, and deal with this right now. It's an interesting lesson around that. Um, and then some of the other controllers that are, are used commonly uh, in containers, uh, a few of these haven't actually landed upstream. Like they're mostly done, uh, but they haven't gone out in mainline kernels. I think the CPU sets landed, right, and freezer is landing. Uh, so that'll be, that'll be all, all lined up here really soon. But again, the thing that like, really actually concerns me about this is we don't want any we don't want the ecosystem to be dependent on one versus the other. That's bad. That's a bad experience, right? We don't want a deb and RPM kind of situation here. So, uh, you know, when things like OpenJDK actually do a quick check and read the C groups to see, am I running in a container or do I have the whole system, right? Right now, that's a V1 specific call. Uh, we need to get to a space to where more user space isn't written around a particular implementation of C groups because now we have to, like that problem goes up from the cluster view and we have to actually track and taint nodes or, or label nodes rather uh, to know where you can run. Or, and like that's a problem nobody wants to deal with, right? So we gotta get, we gotta get over to V2 um, before this gets out of control from that hand. So from the distribution side of the house, um, we are, we're working on flipping Fedora to default to V2 with Fedora 31. So that's like November timeframe. Uh, and so like the, the criteria for that is libvert, uh, the run C stuff has to be in place or else we can't flip the switch. Uh, we know Kubernetes is not likely to be done with that at that point. And of course you can always easily boot a system in V1 and it's not a problem. So uh, that'll be like, an, you'll opt to V1 uh, in this stuff. On the rel side of the house, by the way, rel eight is in beta. Everybody here used it. Of course, just for the recording, all, hand, all heads are nodding. Um, why are you laughing? Don't laugh, <laughs> cut this out. Um, uh, so rel, rel 8 is gonna continue to default to V1, uh, but in a, in a soon minor release, uh, I said A1, but maybe A2, uh, we will also have full support for V2. So rel 8 is our release that is gonna kind of bridge this gap and live in this dual world uh, kind of secret life. Um, so anyway, uh, and then, you know, if we miss on Fedora 31, what, what we don't want to have is the same situation in like a RHEL 9 world. <laughs> so that's, that's why we got we to gotta hit this uh, in Fedora 31. And so that's 
that's why this work is so important. Um, we do think, I, I, I did reach out to um, some of the fantastic people in SUSE. They don't have a specific date, uh, but they think uh, it may be possible to flip uh, either maybe in pop before Fedora. So we'll, we'll see how that goes. But I'm not actually aware of other distributions plans. Uh, but once one distro normally goes for the stuff, a lot of people follow suit. Uh, so now, if anybody wants to try V2 now, it's super easy to get your hands on. In fact, you can just mount up, you know, type secret V2, none, and then pass it a path. By the way, that's a 90s reference, so if you're like under the age of 30, you may not, you may not remember that, that's okay. Uh, but it's really easy to just get the hierarchy and start looking at the controllers. Um, a better way to use V2 is actually to boot your system with the systemd uh, unified secret hierarchy. Uh, you know, just to pin that to the kernel and boot up, everything works, you have the unified hierarchy. Uh, systemd will it'll translate any of the, well, you would do like a best effort translate of any of the old, uh, like CPU shares become uh, CPU weight and the, these types of, uh, call them higher level controllers, but that, that's the newer terminology there. So it's really easy to just fire up and actually use this stuff. So if you have systems today that aren't doing containers, vert and kube, uh, this is stuff you can go ahead and, and, and leverage and get the benefits like Dejun walked us through that Facebook's doing, uh, which is fantastic. Uh, I can't wait to use that stuff and open shift. Um, Okay, and just a couple other quick hitters here. Uh, so you can run, uh, you can run like this hybrid mode where you have V1 and 2 available, uh, but the same controller can't be used in both spaces. So it's it's kind of it's kind of useless. So we really recommend you pick one or the other. That's that's ideal. Um, and yeah, and then if you just want to disable controllers one at a time, you can do that as well. So. That's really all we had. We, we just want this to be like an awareness talk of like kind of what is that value of secret V2? Why is it important that we go there? We don't want the ecosystem to kind of split. We don't want more user space being attached to one or the other, right? This should be a low level implementation that you know, your container runtime or your wonderful init system abstracts away for you, right? So uh, that's really why we want to make this aware uh, with everybody. So, uh, we've got a few links here. Again, we'll, we'll make these slides available. So if anybody wants to read up and become uh, an expert, this is a great topic to spend a lunch break on uh, and impress all your coworkers. So I think that's, that's all we have. So thank you for having us, and thank you guys for, for being here. Thanks.